بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد It's important for us to understand the importance of evidence in Islam and knowing the Quran and the Sunnah, knowing our Islam, knowing how to practice our deen in accordance with the Adillah and make sure that what we do is in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een the early scholars, the Salaf of this Ummah radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een so knowledge is imperative the Prophet sallallahu said من, سا... من سلك طريقا يتلمسه به علما سهل الله له طريقا إلى الجنة whenever whoever traverses the path to seek knowledge, talking about Islamic knowledge, al nafia then Allah will make easy for him the path to Jannah. The, the Salaf of this Ummah, the pious predecessors, the early scholars, they used to regard seeking knowledge, Talib al-Ilm, Talib al-Jannah, that seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. With this being said, it's imperative that we go back to the ulama, the scholars, when we have problems with our religion. And it is absolutely imperative that we do not speak without knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Vasal ahli dhikrin kuntum la ta'alamun. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. And I want to give an example that one of our brothers and or sisters fell into, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them and for, forgive us all and, and bless us all with sincerity and thabat ala sunnah. But to show how we can go astray if we don't seek knowledge and we don't go back to the people of knowledge. So listen to this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then we'll see how the, uh, one of our Muslim brothers or sisters fell into error with regards to this hadith and explained it or used it to justify their own practices. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Bilal, Bilal, tell me which act tell me which act you did at the time of the morning prayer, for which you hope to receive good reward, for I heard during the night the sound of your footsteps before me in paradise. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu replied, I did not do any act in Islam for which I hope to get any benefit but this, that when I perform complete ablution during the night or day, I observe prayer with that purification, what Allah has ordained for me to pray. And this is collected in Sahih Muslim. The ulama, when, regarding this hadith, some of the things you'll find in the explanation of Sahih Muslim by Imam Nawawi and, and some of the other uh, explanations of this hadith, you'll find that they, they focus a lot on the import the uh, benefit of sharing dreams with someone uh, you know for a righteous person sharing a good dream with with someone or and and the benefits uh, derived from that also you'll find this hadith mentioning the importance of tahara and purification and so forth but let's just see what our sister fell into, may Allah forgive us and her. She used this hadith to justify actions that the Prophet ﷺ did not do, such as uh, various types of dhikr. And her logic is that Bilal anhu was doing a prayer that the Prophet ﷺ did not do, and that it was not seen as a bid'ah. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with sitting in a circle and doing dhikr and, and so forth. Again, important to go back to the people of knowledge before we try to understand the religion according to our own whims. And in regards to this understanding, this is a false understanding. This is an understanding that I don't believe, I've never heard anyone who has derived this ahkam, these rulings, before this understanding so that's one thing is also always look to who preceded you in this statement if ever you want to practice something in islam who preceded you with this understanding that's one thing to look at another important issue is to also know the basic qaida if you learn this this will help you in many of your practices in islam is that 
the foundation or the the asl of ibadat is hadr wa asla mu'amalat al-ibaha basically this means that the the origin of all worship in islam is that it's prohibited unless there is a text to substantiate that action as ibadah for example salat if someone came up with a new type of prayer or a new time for prayer we would say automatically that is haram unless they can bring evidence for that worship that they're doing or someone came up with anything that has to do with worship so the asl this is what the ulama you'll find in the madhabs the imam of imam uh uh imam uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam uh, Malik, and Imam Ahmed. You'll find this in Usul of Fiqh, in the study of Usul of Fiqh, these principles. And that the origin of all things, all other things, our transactions, our social interactions, our mu'amalat, is that it's permissible. The things you wear, the food you eat, it's all permissible unless there's a text or something, some dalil that comes to show that that thing is prohibited. So for example, the reason we know pork is prohibited is only because there's a Quranic ayat, there's Quranic verses to substantiate that pork is prohibited. And we know that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But otherwise, everything would be permissible unless we have a text to uh, support that it is haram or we have some other dalil. Now let's quickly talk about dalil in Islam. Dalil is based on four things. Dalil is based on the Qur'an, means it comes from the Qur'an, or it comes from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the sound, authentic Sunnah of him, والسلام, or the third thing is that Dalil comes from, or evidence comes from, uh, uh, ijma or uh, consensus of the scholars, consensus of the Sahaba, consensus of the scholars of that time, that they have consensus that this such and such is halal, or such and such is haram, or what have you. And the fourth level of evidence, or the fourth type of evidence, is qiyas. Qiyas meaning uh, making an analogy, and this is for ahl al-ilm, because there is, there's analogies that are correct, and there's analogies that are incorrect. The correct analogy, it has certain conditions, and this is not the place to talk about those issues in depth. But those are the basic things. So you have to have evidence for anything you uh, practice in Islam, and for how you understand Looking at this hadith, there is no indication to use this hadith uh, to say that there is a, a new type of dhikr that you can do because the Prophet ﷺ didn't keep the wudu like Bilal. And in fact, Bilal was not doing any different, uh, any new salat. He was not doing anything. He said that, what did he say in the hadith? I did not do so when I perform. Uh, any act in Islam for which I hope to gain benefit, but this, that when I perform complete ablution during the day or, not, or, or night or day, I observe prayer with that purification, meaning that he tried to stay in wudu. He tried to stay in wudu. What Allah has ordained for me to pray, meaning that he prayed with that same wudu, that same ablution, he tried to keep it as long as he could without breaking it. So there's no new ibadah there. Also, another point which illustrates the falsehood, unfortunately, of our sister, may Allah forgive us and her, of that, 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 uh, that logic, or where that logic is, is not sound logic. Because, for one, even if there was a different type of salat or different type of action that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do, but it was during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was from the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'in, and... They, they, they let the Prophet ﷺ know. So what I'm saying here, in this hadith, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was doing, he was keeping in wudu, and this was something, the Prophet ﷺ asked him about his, because the Prophet ﷺ saw him in a dream. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what are you doing that is uh, the, the reason that I see you in the, you're doing some great, some act of ibadah, you're doing something great, that for the reason that I see you in Jannah. And Bilal just said that I stay in wudu. The point being here, Bilal said this what? During the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bilal said this to who? Radiallahu ta'ala. He said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is not... 
This is during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. We are not with the Prophet ﷺ except for that we follow his sunnah ﷺ. So there's no way we could just start a new practice and say that we're consulting the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Bilal was asked by the Messenger of Allah ﷺ during his lifetime and the Prophet ﷺ agreed and, and said that action was okay. If the Prophet ﷺ does not say that something is haram or say that something's impermissible, then that means it is from his sunnah. So that means Bilal was doing the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Why? Because what is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? And this will be the end of, of this uh, quick uh, discussion. The sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ to Ahl Hadith, they are... Aqwal wa af'al wa wa they are the 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 statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi They are the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi They are what's called taqrirat of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi meaning those things that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi allowed. And the fourth thing is is relating to is khulkia wa khalkia the the um the manners of the Prophet Sallallahu and his physical characteristics. All of those things are from the Sunnah. So the Sunnah uh Qawliya, something that the Prophet Sallallahu stated was permissible or not permissible or what have you, uh, or that that he said to do, then that's from his Sunnah. Uh something that the Prophet Sallallahu uh did, but he didn't speak about, but he did it, that's from his Sunnah. And if, if the Prophet ﷺ allowed something and he didn't say that it was haram because it was an obligation upon him being the imam of the muttaqin, the imam of the pious, ﷺ, that he would command the good and he forbid the evil. So the Prophet ﷺ never sat in a situation, allowed for the haram to go by and didn't speak against it. So meaning anything that he allowed in his presence was halal and from his sunnah. And an example of that that the ulama usually give, uh, or many of those scholars mention, from this sunnah, the sunnah taqrirat, the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam allowing something, and that being from his sunnah, is that Khalid bin Walid, رضي, رضي عنه, he had some uh, a lizard, and he put the lizard on the table, he was going to eat the lizard. And the Prophet and he, you know, wanted the Prophet to partake in it. The Prophet didn't want to take, didn't from eat from the lizard. And then he wondered, is this halal or is haram? The Prophet, you know, no, it's not haram. This is the meaning of the hadith. The Prophet didn't negate and say that it was haram. He just said, Laysa bi the Komi. He said, it is not from the from the land of my people, meaning he his it was not according to his custom to eat iguana or, or lizard, whatever kind of lizard the bub is, it looks like an iguana. And this was not from the custom of the Prophet. ﷺ. But what it is considered from his sunnah. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said it was permissible, even though he did not eat bub, he did not like bub. That was not from the uh, the custom of his people, so he didn't partake in it. That is Sunnah Taqririya. Because why? Because the prophet it was happened during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam either was silent about it or he said it was okay, but he didn't he didn't partake in it and he didn't do it. He didn't do the action or he might not have said anything about it. But he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed for it to happen. This is called Sunnah Taqririya. So in this hadith this is Sunnah Taqririya, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam show, you know, verified for Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he was doing a righteous act which was trying to keep his wudu and continued to pray his prayers with the same wudu. And this is just hopefully something that will give us some enlightenment to know and understand that we cannot, and it's imperative that we do not try to make our own rulings, especially if we don't even know the Arabic language first and foremost. Let's just look at quickly some of the conditions for ijtihad, because none of us are from Ahla Ijtihad. Ijtihad is like those major scholars who have the ability, and, 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 and the imams, they differ over some of the conditions, but let's talk about some of the conditions, the general condition. A person who makes ijtihad, one of the conditions, and this is coming from Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, he's explaining this in his book, which is a, a, soul, of bit, a, soul, a soul of fiqh, 
book Shar Usul Min Ilm Usul. He said the first thing that the person of Ijtihad is that they have to know the Adilla of the Sharia that they're going to need to make Ijtihad, meaning they should be memorize the Quran, they should memorize a lot of the Sunnah in order to be able to make Ijtihad because you have to know an evidence. Number two, uh, that they must know uh, those you know related to um, Hadith, um, the science of Hadith. They must know the science of hadith because they have to be able to distinguish what is an authentic hadith and what is uh, 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 an, an, an inauthentic hadith, a hadith that is da'if, between sahih wa da'if. And they have to know, have to have knowledge about the isnad, the chain of narrators, and the knowledge ilm rijal uh, Another thing for Ahli Ijtihad is they also have to know an nasikh wal mansukh. They have to have knowledge about uh, when something is abrogated and what is what abrogated, what verse or dalil abrogated the other verse. And they also have to have knowledge about the ijma of the ulama, so that when they, whenever they make a fatawa or they make a ruling, that it is not against what the ijma that came before them or is in their time is uh, making, uh, uh, you know, have consensus on. Another thing that the person of ijtihad has to have is that they have to know the evidence uh the the way to deal with the evidence you know when it's specific when it's general what evidence makes something uh you know restricted in this itch situation and in another situation it it, it makes uh you know it, it it's the opposite of that another thing is a person has to know be strong in the arabic language they have to be strong in usul of fiqh you know the uh, the study not just the ahkam of fiqh but the study of the principles of fiqh, and related to um, evidences and relating to the sharia terminologies and what is specific, what is restricted, what is mutlaq uh, muqayyid, you know, that which is restricted and that which is uh, non-restricted, that which is clear and that which is a general verse. They need to have knowledge of all those things. Those are just some of the things. Then they have to have knowledge of istinbat, hakeva istinbat, Meaning that they have to have knowledge of how to take the rulings from the evidences that they're studying. So, for example, this hadith, we just read this hadith. All of us in English can probably understand this hadith, at least understand the basic of this hadith in the basic language. But even that shows there, there, there was some misunderstanding talking about extra prayers. That What does that have to do with anything in this hadith? I don't know. But the point being... So we have basic understanding, we can read it in our language. But can we take rulings from it? And are we bringing rulings that no one in the Sharia who's come before us, the Salaf of this Ummah, has never heard of? That is what's imperative, that's the question. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and forgive our sister. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with ikhlas, with thabat. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.